Hi. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Luca Pizzamiglio. It's complicated enough for everyone. Uh, I will talk about um, Rust on FreeBSD. Uh, who am I? I'm a FreeBSD user since a long time ago. I had become a contributor in 2011. And now I am a um, port committer since one year, uh, for one year now. Um, my main work on FreeBSD is about um, packages and so on. Uh, but also, I have worked in the past also on the kernel side and so on, but I will speak um, more later. The program today is kind of a small introduction of what FreeBSD is. I guess a lot of people know more or less what it is, but just to make things uh, clear so we are on the same page, uh, what the state of Rust on FreeBSD currently, and then um, kind of a way how uh, FreeBSD packages works and how it's possible to provide packages uh, of FreeBSD applications on FreeBSD, how it works and how was the challenges behind it. So this is a picture of the, basically the history of Unix. Um, as you see, there is a small line here that is the Unix family and the Unix-like systems. This is, you can find it on, um, uh, on Wikipedia. It's not something that I picture of. Um, as you see, here there is Linux. It's an independent, completely independent tree. Uh, as everyone knows, the history of Linux, Linux Torvald started in 1991, uh, its own tree, and it evolved until now. Uh, and then this is the Unix family. How it started, started with on PDP, uh, seven as an operating system and evolved in a different way. This is why you see this. Normally, people talk about Unix as a family. Um, the main difference is that Unix uh, has a BSD, the state for Berkeley software uh, distribution, BSD license. This is completely different from the GPL one. The BSD license allows to do whatever you want with the code. It means that uh, this was this yellow one was a mixed um, open source, closed source. And from that, you can see closed source solutions and open source solutions. Not only if you see, then, for instance, FreeBSD contribute to become Mac OS X. Mac OS X is basically based on the FreeBSD kernel. Um, and former version was the NetBSD contribution. Um, but what happens inside this kind of stuff is um, it's not only a whole project that can fork, but also you can have several features of, um, of the operating system like uh, firewall. For instance, this is OpenBSD, and at a certain point, more or less here, uh, FreeBSD developers decide to port the PF, the firewall OpenBSD, in FreeBSD. And at that point, those projects just fork, but you can have all these kind of uh, features moving uh, on and on uh, all the time. Um, and that's happened with, for instance, with Solaris. It became open Solaris at that time when uh, Sun was still existing. Um, and a lot of features there went then to FreeBSD, like ZFS, DTrace, and other stuff like that. Obviously, always with these strange uh, licensing issues. Um, and I guess five years ago, FreeBSD as a project started to get rid of all GPL stuff because GPL v3 is completely incompatible with this licensing system. So it has to be GPL v3 free. There is still some GPL v2, but um, yeah. And for instance, a lot of commercial products come out from FreeBSD. The operating system of um, the, how it's called, the PlayStation 4 is based on FreeBSD. Basically what Sony did, okay, we fork it, we customize, Obviously, then you cannot merge back stuff. You can merge maybe something, but then you can fork and create products with that and so on. So that's the big, the main differences between uh, two products. And then the other big difference is that how we know Linux, Linux is normally just the kernel and distribution is everything else. We talk about distribution today and every distribution has its own installer, its own packages system. Okay, more or less every distribution has its own. Um, but they decide which toolchain use, uh, how they split packages, if they make the devil version and so on. Um, FreeBSD is 
slightly different. It's not just a kernel. It's the kernel bootloader and it's a closed world. There is uh, system libraries, toolchain, services, and installer, and everything else is packages. Um, packages are not part of FreeBSD, obviously, but they are, you have to build them. And you have web servers, other languages, tool chains, and so on. So you can have multiple compilers uh, com installed at the same time, multiple versions of Python, whatever. Question so far? Last on FreeBSD, uh, so there is one package called uh, Langrust. Uh, luckily enough, um, Rust supports FreeBSD, OpenBSD and NetBSD, so more or less all BSDs. Um, so it, there is no problem to build it. This package is just um, Rust stable, so the last Rust stable version. Maybe there will be a Rust 2018 for the future, I'm not really sure, but uh, we'll see. And this package installs everything, Rust C, Cargo is just everything that is needed to uh, build other Rust projects. Um, Rust app is supported by FreeBSD. So what I use here on my laptop, I use FreeBSD, um, and I install everything via Rust app. So I install the, uh, every version of Rust, so nightly and, and stable normally, but bit as well. And then there is support for Clip Preview. Rust FMT is a different one, so you have to install the component called Rust FMT Preview, but everything is, is there. So there is nothing from Rust perspective that is missing to work on FreeBSD. Uh, for Editor and IDE, uh, the sad news is there is no support on Electron on FreeBSD. I work on that, it's a long story, out of topic, uh, but we have no Atom, no VS Code, Nothing of this kind of stuff run on FreeBSD. Actually, I have Electron running on my laptop, but it's complicated. Um, what I do normally, I use Vim. Uh, so with Rust Vim, you complete me Syntastic. I have everything I can ask for a development uh, platform. So, but this is more desktop uh, user usage than uh, language itself. There is no missing features, so to say. There was actually a problem with the libc uh, bindings. It was solved some times ago because um, there was, as you know, um, libc is the interface between the operating system and the user space. And as you see in C, um, operating systems are written in C, so this interface is written in C, and the retro type wasn't well defined between multiple Unixes. So it's an integer whatever that means. In C, integer means a broad uh, spectrum of possible uh, type. Could be 64-bit, could be 32-bit, it depends on a lot of things. So there were some uh, problems there, uh, but it was solved now. So there is everything that compiles normally on Linux and from Rust perspective, compiles also on, um, on FreeBSD. Uh, what is a package and uh, how package works on FreeBSD? Uh, packages are more or less the same as every uh, distribution, so are binary blobs that you just install on your system and they works, period. Uh, FreeBSD port, what it is exactly is um, the recipe to install the software and or build the package. Basically is uh, in every other, uh, 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 it calls for ARC, is called AUR, something like that. You have package base, basically this kind of instruction, where to fetch in, uh, uh, sources, how to dependencies, and so on. And this is called FreeBSD port. With those recipes, you can directly install your software, or you can build a package. Um, there are a huge amount of them. Uh, and how it works, it's, it's basically a meta, system based on makefile that support every possible languages, every possible build mechanism. So uh, Ninja, CMake, uh, Maven, Autotools, and so on. So it's basically one meta platform to build everything, something similar to Portage or from Gen2 or other kind of stuff. But where it comes from? Um, in the past, I mean, the past, the 90s was really popular. Uh, how you, you install 
a typical target that, yeah, oh, this is software, this is target that, you download them from SourceForge, somehow remember it, and you run just configure, make, make, install. And how that works is that configure was searching for dependencies for libraries, where the libraries are and where the includes are um, C or C++ normally. Um, so prepare all make files, then you run make, it builds everything, and then you may make install and install your program or your libraries in your system. Um, so that is basically the base how uh, to build a package uh, come from. There are multiple targets. You have make fetch to fetch binaries, make checksum to verify that those binaries are the supposed one, uh, make extract, extract the binaries, make patch is an optional step to apply local patches, um, make configure, run the configure, make build will build your program, make stage will install the program in a kind of a sandbox, and then this sandbox can be used to install your program to your system or to create a package. And this is how on FreeBSD those uh, FreeBSD ports work. Those are the steps that has to be uh, performed. If you run make install, everything comes automatically. Um, why I put that there? Basically, there is um, there was some years ago an effort between uh, Linux distributions and uh, BSDs. Um, it was this effort called reproducible build. It was an effort to be able to build packages in a reproducible way. That means that if I run the build twice, the output should be exactly the same. So they start to um, understand how to make this possible uh, and so on. And they came out um, with several solutions. One is, okay, you have to provide the checksum of your sources because you know there is, you are building software provided by someone else. And this someone else can be nice and change the version of number of your packages if it changes something. But not everyone is nice. So if someone is make some dirty things, oh, I made a I make a tag, but then there was a bug. I don't want to make a new tag. I mean, there is several. In the, in the past, uh, there were several bad situations uh, or to avoid tampering. The port recipe hosts also the checksum of your binaries, so it can be verified. So when the package system, the package builder, uh, downloads everything, that verify everything. Uh, everything has to be consistent at the same time and so on. Uh, but imagine to the, the FreeBSD package builder, it's an open source project, uh, you can use it, and it runs basically two different containers. One is used to download um, the sources, and the other one is used to build everything uh, using the output of the first one. This is an issue with, uh, with Rust, because cargo, there is no cargo fetch. When you run cargo build, it downloads everything that you need and it builds everything. Uh, and that is not allowed in this model at all. So that was the first uh, big issue. Uh, so to ideally, what we want to do is make fetch will fetch crates, crates all dependencies. Uh, make checksum will verify those crates. Um, make extracts will extract them. And actually, this is not really true. It's here. And we'll tell Scargo to download, um, to use the download crates instead of use the GitHub provide them in the, for the internet ones, so to say. Uh, and then finally here, we can say, OK, make build, we can use Cargo build. And with make stage, it can be used by Cargo install to install everything that is your application to this sandbox environment. And then uh, make install or make package can then use this output, but this is extra stuff. To do that, um, yeah, in the recipe, you need to provide also the list of dependencies that you that your Rust application has. Uh, this is tedious, but there is some uh, utility to do that. 
And not only the license problem that before was mentioned, there is a specific target to make. You can say, please tell me all the licenses of all crates that is dependency. So you can have the list of all licenses and you can see probably that there are some conflicting licenses in what you're doing or something like that. Uh, but we'll, we'll get uh, a little bit more with that. Basically, when you have um, a Rust program, that, a Rust project, a Rust uh, application that you want to create as a package, you use uh, this uses cargo that will do more or less everything that we saw here automatically for you. So it's already in the framework, so you have to do basically almost nothing. The thing you have to do is to use this additional target called uh, cargo crates. It will give you automatically the list of all crates that uh, with version that your application needs. And then with make make some, it will automatically compute all the uh, checksum for you. So you have just to adjust in those files. Um, and that's it. I would probably just show you some real uh, example, just to give you uh, more grasp of what more or less that means. Uh, we see a small uh, package, then how the magic is performed, and then um, Something that I heard before, uh, how it's difficult to, uh, to manage Rust applications on, on a distribution. Um, because, yeah, we'll see that later. So this is uh, a really small application. There are three files, this info, make file, and package description. Package description is just a description about the package. The dist info, just give a look immediately what it is, um, is the information about all the, the packages to be downloaded. So you see every uh, single um, create this dependency, there is the checksum and the size. But what is more interesting is here. Uh, this is basically the recipe that you have to specify. There is the port name, the version, uh, some meta information there and there. Um, what is important is the uses cargo that basically tells these meta uh, environments to use cargo and Rust to build everything. This is our small information to tell that this project is hosted on GitHub. So it would take uh, Pizzamix account, the port name is the project, the version is 012. Uh, it basically builds where to get the, the sources. Um, this is only one file, so this is the list of files that you have installed. And this cargo crate uh, is the full list of all uh, crates that my small application uh, needs. That has to be specified there. And the uh, only one thing that is missing in cargo is that in normally uh, you want to install stripped, com uh, stripped executables. There is a kind of uh, small passage that you, uh, step that you can do on binaries to reduce the final size. It makes less a, a bit less um, debuggable, but to deliver release versions you want to, I mean, I guess it cut 30 or 40 percent of the size uh, of a statically compiled binary. So it's quite important if you want to deliver uh, binary stuff. And just to make it to see in action, if you run here mark uh, cargo crates, it basically is, it downloads. Yep. Uh, I tested it. Yeah. Whatever. It downloads, basically it's open, the, your project, it looks automatically in the cargo lock. If it's not there, it's automatically open it, and it creates it, and then it downloads, now it's, for some reason my network doesn't work. Um, it downloads then uh, all possible other um, 
craze to give you a full, um, a full possible, uh, a full list. Um, how basically that works is here. So this, this is the how the magic works. Just with this use cargo, this file is automatically included. Um, I will go directly to what is important, um, and then I'll explain. Yeah. Um, what it does, it in the extract, it uses this cargo extra target. This is an additional one. This is make file syntax, so to say. So this is an additional target, and what it does, it it extracts all uh, crates, and then it moves them in a specific directory that is um, that is then used again where uh, to generate. When it's under configure, it will generate this file, uh, this directory, and then inside this file, cargo config, it will create basically, um, it replaced creates.io with a custom sources to use a specific directory. So in this way, it's cheating uh, cargo and telling, hey, don't use GitHub, uh, whatever, creates.io, but use this directory already filled up with all uh, the crates that you need. And in this, in doing this way, you don't need any internet connection to download anything. Basically, you download anything before, you extract in a proper way, you cheat uh, cargo to use the local version of stuff, and you also run cargo updates, making sure that it's happy. And then uh, the cargo, the, the build phase is just running uh, cargo build. Um, there are and install is basically running cargo install, installing in the proper uh, stage directory, and then everything else is more or less uh, automatically done. There is an additional uh, target. You can make, make tests if you run uh, tests provided by your uh, package, and that is supported as well. And there are these two additional Helper target one is cargo crates, what we I tried to run before. That basically provides you the full list of all dependencies with versions, so all the crates uh, with versions, and something that yeah, there's project to to get these things, but also cargo crates licenses. It will extract all licenses from all crates automatically, giving you the full list of licenses of all dependencies, and that would be probably a problem in the future because when you have a statically linked uh, blob and you have crates that are GPLv3, something that are more permissive and they are not theoretically uh, allowed to coexist. So not every license is compatible with other ones. And you don't have LGPL that is the permissive library, so-called GPL. Uh, so I don't know exactly, I'm not an expert, but that could be theoretically uh, a program for Go as well as similar issues because it generates a big uh, static uh, blob. There is one aspect that is not really um, Rust oriented and that is um, those. I have to explain more or less what that, what that means. If in your cargo crate there is, for instance, the get text sys, whatever version, it will uh, okay include basically it will add the needed uh, library uh, dependencies. The get sys, uh, I guess everyone knows those sys normally are the uh, wrapper to uh, C code, so it's automatically for the already known. Um, Crates that has binary uh, dependencies, they're automatically managed by this file, so it automatically adds eventual dependencies. And if it's possible, it will also help you to um, instruct the cargo environment to how to compile this specific um, crates dependency in the proper way. And in the proper way means in um, in FreeBSD as is never linked statically, but always linked dynamically. Uh, even if 
I mean, the most common uh, use case is OpenSSL. Why do you want OpenSSL linked dynamically? Uh, obviously, you don't want to rebuild everything all the time. Basically, you want to just install a new version of OpenSSL that has a vulnerability per day. So you don't want to, you don't, you don't have material time to rebuild everything every day and reinstall everything every day. Uh, so those are, I mean, the standard way in FreeBSD, but I guess in all package systems is to use shared library as much as possible. And that brings me to the last example that created me a lot of issues. I tried to uh, port SC cache. <coughs> Actually, it was really funny because SC cache is part of uh, Rustup. So I already had it. But everything that is Rustup is hard to be used inside this uh, framework. So I want a package that has been installed. And I want something that is compatible to this. Um, I guess this is a new version. Maybe. What happened? Um, something that I told before that was really nice to have uh, this, that there is already present, this detector of uh, newer version of dependencies. I guess that everyone wants to avoid this kind of stuff. I make bigger. True version of ASCII, true their version of Bing code, uh, and there are full of other uh, problems like that. And they're not really problems, but um, what happened with SC cache, now it's solved. Uh, I, I solved it, but uh, I'll tell you also how. SC cache is based on request. Uh, Request 088, strictly this version, nothing. There is also 0 0.9, but doesn't work because this program is based on uh, an unstable features of request for the async uh, communication. Request 088 use native TLS, native TLS, yeah, uh, 015, and there is a native TLS 0 0.2, but because the former version used this crate, so you cannot update both. Native TLS use open, uh, OpenSSL 0 0.9. 0 0.9 use an older version of OpenSSL Sys that only supports OpenSSL 1.10. Previously update to open, uh, OpenSSL 1.1.1, it doesn't build. And there are some crates using OpenSSL 1.10, uh, 0 0.10, and it works great. Other doesn't work. The usual way to solve this kind of issues in FreeBSD is there is one good thing. We have all crates already downloaded. So what we can do is exploit this patch uh, step and providing a patch, you don't have really to read it, but the original one, when I just download it, uh, this patch will remove, okay, this is not very important, but it will remove OpenSSL from the dependencies of uh, native TLS. It'll say, hey, use the newer one. Uh, it will remove from cargo lock also OpenSSL 094. Um, and because that was the only one using Bitflex 091, it will remove also uh, Bitflex 091 because it's unused. It will clean up removing checksum and so on. And then it will apply um, the patch to native TLS. There is basically uh, in the GitHub, uh, in GitHub, you see the commit of native TLS that move from the former version of OpenSSL to the new one. Takes this patch, put in there, create a, just a, a huge big patch that solves this issue using basically native TLS 1.5 with this small patch, remove the former uh, create dependencies and everything magically works. I mean, I didn't de develop this kind of stuff, but the native TLS guy did, uh, that's, yeah. 
And that is quite typical in, uh, in packaging system when you have to find a balance with your system, how it's configured, and something that comes from outside is designed a different way if it doesn't fit. So I guess every other distribution does similar things. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you want the last thing running with the old version, you have to do other things like that. What is funny is normally in FreeBSD you have old things that doesn't compile with the new one, so you have to in include newer patches to make things work, and this is more or less how uh, we survive all the times. But yeah, there is only one other thing that I want to show you. Um, it's always here. Funny enough, uh, in the list of crazy star the dependencies, there is, I, mean, I compile on FreeBSD and I have to download all of them. All of them. You have to download them. Cargo wants them there. Then it decides, obviously, if they are needed or not. Okay, this is not Windows, could be Linux, Mac OS X, whatever. Those are downloaded. Because when you verify at the beginning, everything has to be there. There is also, I don't know, every operating system has to be there. Then Cargo decides to ignore when it builds. But at the beginning, in the Cargo lock, they are present, because in the Cargo lock, for whatever reasons, there are other uh, crates that want to use them and so on. So you always have to, I try to remove them. I get it up. I mean, uh, it's fun enough to have to download Windows code all the times, but that's uh, something that happens all the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess. We saw, yep, and thank you. <laughs> I promised Matthias to reach 15 slides, but uh, just 12. So if there's any questions, uh, yep. You first. So I maintain a dash sys crate for mm -hmm. binding to a C library. And I was wondering, is there anything I could do to make your life easier so it will work on FreeBSD without nasty patches being needed? Because this is quite a niche library and I don't see a lot of people <laughs> working magic to make it uh, compile. Uh, the only thing that is really important is to use the last version of Crate, period. Because for how uh, the, I mean, these dependencies Crate that you don't see, that's why this, features that uh, Rust provides is really useful. You don't want this duplicated stuff. If you have Bitflex 09 and Bitflex 010, the 09 is abandoned. It's not used anymore. I mean, the developers just released a new version. They are only maintaining the last version. They're not maintaining the former version normally. So if there is a bug there or whatever, they are still using some deprecated stuff. In this case, OpenSSL because it's a shared library. If you want shared libraries, you have to know that, okay, the last version is supporting the last version of the other things. So it's the only thing is really to keep all uh, dependencies really up to date and everything has come for free. Um, do you use the links attribute in cargo.toml? Uh, it's supposed to be for dash sys crates so they can specify, hey, I need this dynamic system library to be linked. So normally um, I can... Turn back. I can show you um, what how it is done normally. Uh, there are. Like, do any dash sys crates build without magic? Is there is there ah. a, a happy path? So normally, yes. I mean, several okay. of them. Uh, yeah. It's without. I can show you one example of something that was. Um, I have to dealt directly. Uh, cargo. cargo. Um, where are we? Here. As you can see, normally it's just, oh, you need CMake. Okay, I, you, that means that you need CMake. In this case, of free type, you want free type. This is the way how you express uh, dependencies. Sometimes 
you need those kind of stuff for whatever reasons. Uh, additional environment variables for cargo to know how to build them. And one typical example is, uh, I know uh, Pascal had a problem with libgeeks. That was, for instance, how to do it. If there is multiple ways to, to build your system, okay, you need some environment in cargo to expressly uh, tell ex exactly how to do it. Mm -hmm. And normally because package config, yeah, there is that for package config because it's not native uh, BSD stuff, but they are added. Uh, like this, for instance, is pretty, uh, this Oniguruma, okay, don't use the bundle one, use the system one, and use the dynamic one instead of the static one. That is what this line means. But I have to open the code, uh, look at the car, how it has to be built, and use these environment variables to do exactly what I want. And that is the way that you can provide uh, if you want to, or if there is only a reasonable way. The thing is, normally, if you read all the instructions, everyone says, use the static version. But then, as if you want kind of a distribution, you don't want static version at all. You want dynamic, because you don't want to rebuild everything all the time. Also, you cannot track them down easily, because it's quite hard. If it's hard, uh, I mean, it's especially bundled version of stuff is really bad for distribution, because you lose track of them. You don't know they are installed. If there is a CVE, security problem on this environment, then it's statically compiled, you don't know that it's in, because when you look at your system, you don't know it's statically compiled, in you, and then you lose it. So you have to technically to extend every vulnerability to all the code that's statically linked. It's, just, it's a mess. So that's why it's... Yeah. Right now, what I'm doing is... Looking for it in package config, and if it's not there, uh, I built a bundled one, but without configuration. And I was wondering if this is too much magic. I, I think it should it be a flag, like, like this one, like uh, system lib onic. Uh, I guess to it tell is... it, no, really don't use the bundled one. So the, the point is, from your point of view, you want to make it easy for everyone to use it. Yeah. So you obviously want to support multiple ways. So you provide a bundle, because if it's not there, uh, you want a bundled one. Uh, I guess it's quite okay. The, part, the, the most important thing, you have to provide a way to use an external one. All right, okay. That's it. Uh, couldn't you just replace all those um, unused win API, win API crates with empty stub crates or something like that? Nope. I mean, uh, I don't know exactly how much cargo needs them and at which level. It depends in several ways. I, maybe yes, but it makes more work to try to find this workaround and download them and install them and ignore them. I mean, as long as they are there, then cargo is gentle enough to ignore them. It's just funny that you have to download Windows code for yeah, every operating system. If you wouldn't want to download them, then you maybe could. Yeah, the point is, uh, if they're not there, it try to download them for whatever reason. I'm not really sure why. It doesn't, basically, because you are cut off from internet, has, okay, this is the only source has to be there. So there is no cargo, IO, uh, whatever. So probably that's the, the, the main issues there. Because I don't recall that it's, they are downloaded. No, I don't, I don't, not really sure. I think it is, I tried once and I said, okay, you know, too much work for minimum, yeah, meaningful uh, improvement. That Thanks. Is. In your list of crates you use, there was a assert CLI or assert command and I know it's a dependency that's basically only ever used when you're writing a test that tests a CLI application, which means that you also include test dependencies or dev dependencies. Is this necessary? It's necessary for the same reason why uh, the Windows code is there. Okay, so cargo doesn't if cargo have a doesn't find like, those. Yeah. It complains because in the cargo log, those are 
the list of packages are all of them there. I mean, car, uh, you have to look at the format of cargo log. It doesn't make this difference. It's the cargo tom that there is this difference, and then you decide to use them or not, depending on what you're doing. But in the cargo log, there is all of them. So if you are cut off from internet, everything that is in the cargo log has to be there. I see. Okay. And then it ignores them or... So speaking of test dependencies, you also um, mentioned that you can test crates, but you have a test mode? Basically, the, so, uh, the test target in the make file uh, is available. So you can use it and automatically run the cargo. Basically, you can invoke cargo test via the make framework. It's not performed in the package build process, but you can do it. Okay. I mean, it's, the test is supported, but it's not performed uh, every time. I mean, uh, to build those packages, it takes two days on a big server. Uh, so they try to... Basically, the, the point is, for every package, there sh should be a maintainer, and the maintainer then is responsible to the well-being of your package or the port, whatever. So it's responsibility of the maintainer to run, make tests in every FreeBSD version and so on. And then, okay, everything is fine. Okay, it's not in the release process per se. It's, it's split it up. The responsibility is split it up. The maintainer run the test, and then the release process just create the package for everyone else. It would be nice to run them both, but for instance, I maintain GDB. If you run make tests on GDB, it would take two hours just to run it, and there is... 1,100 failure. If running on Linux, there are 700 failures. Uh, whatever reason. So it doesn't mean really also, I mean, it depends down on the quality. You have always to imagine that when you create packages, you are dealing with software of someone else. And then you have to touch there somehow to make things that works reliably, not just build them. And uh, sometimes it's just hard. Cool, thanks. F Another weird question. Uh, so as part of the CLI working group, we were talking about how to distribute um, shell completion files, make files, whatsoever. You as a package maintainer are probably also responsible for getting the files out of the yep. build and putting them somewhere. Is there any way we can help you? Is there some convention you love to use and want us to contribute? Um, no. I mean... <laughs> um, yeah, there is conventions. The convention is um, show you. It's easy to show you and to speak, um, but it's almost automatically managed. Uh, let me go share. Uh, side functions. Yeah. Basically, uh, every shell as their own, had already pre-configured. Normally, you know where uh, those auto-completion are expected to, to land. And for instance, for ZSH, okay, yes, hello. They didn't mention. Uh, USL local is where all packages are installed in FreeBSD. So it's quite easy to know what is packages and what is not. And share ZSH site functions where everything is installed. When uh, you see the uh, Rust package, for instance, it will install automatically this cargo. I have installed Alacrity. Alacrity installed automatically. I mean, it's part then of the package. Those files can exist even without the, um, uh, the ZSH installed. Doesn't really matter. RG, for instance, is a, struts, is a Rust program. It's the grep substitution. It works in the same way. It used build a RAS, I guess, to, to create auto-completion and automatically install it. So it's, one is there, it's easy to, to be used. Basically, in the, in, if it's not installed with cargo install, it will, you can copy it manually. You can extend the install phase, copying file manually where it should belong. That's it. Just one small question, maybe yep. to the round as well, because I don't know if you know about it. But is there are there any um, 
ideas to do reproduce, uh, reproducible builds with Rust at all? Are there any efforts? So as far as I know, reproducible builds are an effort from distributions to be able to run twice the same code base and say, okay, we got the same, uh, exactly the same binary. But exactly means with shell, uh, you can make a hash, it comes out the same hash. The problem is mainly the more is most uh, the biggest issue are, for instance, there are some programs that uh, in the version they put also the timestamp on when they are built, all this kind of stuff. Those kind of stuff should be avoided at all. A version should be enough. Don't put timestamp in your code or whatever. Just don't do it. Yeah, but that's like cargo builds. When I call cargo builds, and for example, somebody else uh, calls cargo builds. Does it produce the same binary? Cargill is already doing, I guess, most of those kind of stuff, I guess. To answer your question, it does if you don't have a build RS. Because exactly what you're saying is not possible in Rust. You cannot include a timestamp unless you execute code, which you can only do if you do build RS. And build RS is a hated feature like the NPM script part of things, but we can't also not get rid of it like the NPM script part of things. So if, if all of your dependencies do not, then you probably get the same, considering the same cargo version, get the same build. I would have another question. Yep. Uh, go back to the to the make file, please. Um, I was wondering, you said you were stripping the library after the, the binary afterwards. Yep. Isn't build dash dot release enough? No, it's not doing it. Are you using build dash of release? Because in the command you said you showed you didn't, and I was wondering if there's a good it's reason. It's using the cargo build, then the cargo install, but there is no strip. Uh, no, I mean, if you if you usually run cargo build, it runs it builds the debug binary, right? Yeah, the no, it used the, the release one. Okay, cool. Um, now, I mean, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, make up users and cargo. Um, yeah, I didn't show where is the cargo build. Um, in the cargo build arcs, um, it's built. Ah, okay, the, there the is uh, on top. here are several. You see, there okay. is. It's built basically these cargo arguments, collecting this environment stuff. Um, is collecting this, for instance, pretty nice. Yeah. If you specify uh, typically for C or C++, uh, the architecture or the CPU optimization is converting in, in the proper Rust flags uh, and so on. So it's building automatically all this kind of stuff uh, in between. Um, and somewhere there is release. All right, cool. If you specify, I mean, there is a, a general knob. It's called with debug. In this case, we will create all packages in debug version. Uh, otherwise, it will be in release. And then if you are, for instance, this is the way you can activate or deactivate features. For instance, for SC cache, I have I'm using cargo features all, but if you want to activate some of them, I mean, they try to mimic all the possible um, features that cargo uh, expose in this way. Uh, but yeah. Cool, thanks. I guess the main problem with strip is part of the um, binutils. So it's a step that is even out from LVM. It's basically from binutils you have strip yeah. uh, that cut off a lot of sections, so symbols and so on. Yep. I think I have a last two-part question. Yep. Um, is FreeBSD free shipping license files with packages? And if so, do you have any automation at all for doing that? So, um, yep. Yeah. Actually, that's something I discovered when I was doing this presentation. Uh, normally, you specify the license of your package for every package. When you build it and you don't have license complaining, hey, there's no license, tell me something. Uh, something I discovered during this uh, presentation was that it's possible to extract the licenses of all crates that you are depending on. Uh, I mean, I think I have some, let me see if I uh, can do it. Uh, if I can run it here, 
Um, nope. By the way, theoretically, you have to do it. I have no idea how to do them. I mean, it's something I discovered two days ago. I didn't have time to play with it. Theoretically, you should put them all the licenses that are needed. If it is double license, you have to say double license. There is a full license framework. Uh, can I show you what it is? OK. And then you have licenses. There is a full database with all of them. And uh, every possible license is present. So you just specify in your package license, blah, blah, blah. And if the file of the, um, is present, you specify, OK, this is license file. You can have custom ones if there are some, someone come up with, uh, with new ones and so on. They are basically used um, to avoid not distributable files or distributable packages. There is some package. They are not packageable. Some ports about uh, Java stuff that you have to download manually because there is no license, but then it's built automatically. But for license restrictions, uh, they are performing this way. I mean, yeah, but I don't know. If this kind of with crates, I don't know exactly how it works. But normally with my project, I just put, I have a couple of things. Okay, this is BSD, license BSD, this is GPL, license GPL. MPL, APL, I mean, uh, all of them there. Yeah, I think like um, what I'm interested in particular is that BSD technically requires that you always ship like the license text because there's always that one different bit that says what the copying information is, right? Um, and you, yep. or at least MIT has that. I'm not sure about BSD actually. But like you have a requirement to reproduce that exact copying notice, which is probably also the reason that you had files like BSD.octave and something in the license folder. So you would then just add one line, like license file equals something, and that would... You have to split the concept of FreeBSD and FreeBSD packages. Yeah. FreeBSD is BSD license or compatible. Sure, packages but no, I'm, are I'm talking about packages being BSD licensed. Packages BSD licenses, then, I mean, the point is, every package then is marked with their own license. So then it's automatically, yeah, you have... Mm, package files, I don't know, botnet, okay, no, it's not there. Uh, that. Yeah. Basically, with every package comes also the license with them. Okay. All but, the time. I mean, yeah. it's part, those are, I mean, I guess you know that. It's the cat replacement written in Rust. Suggested to use it. It's great. Uh, and yeah, I just marked the, in the, the make file that is, Apache, and then it comes automatically, it's shipped automatically, the license with it. This is how this package, all the files that are installed with this package, automatically. Yeah. You just specify the license and it carry uh, the license in the proper way. So, yeah. But like for, for BSD, there is no way to like copy a generic one, right? You would have to take that from the source and you'd have to take, to no, figure out there what it's called. There are um, four types of BSD licenses. BSD two clause, three clause, and four clause. I mean, there are kind of repeatable BSD clauses. They are in the Aussie recognized. Um... Yeah, no, sure. But like what and I'm saying, what I'm don't, saying is that they usually differ like in that one bit, which is the author. And you still have to repeat that verbatim as far as I know. Uh, no. Then with this SPDX thing, uh, in the code, there is only one, and you can even skip it. The point is, nowadays, what you have, you need this copyright of license file in your project, and that will be used for your package. Period. It's good enough, as far as I know. Okay. Like, I, I know that Debian is like copying a verbatim license file for every package that is MIT or BSD license. So, that is what I knew to be the truth, but maybe you have like a different solution for that. So. Um, as far as I know, there is a copy I'm for fine every. I'm like later also. For, for, for every, I mean, it's true for every package that you install, there is a copy of the license. But in, as far as I know, there is a copy of the license for every package that you are installing. So it's not BSD, but every one of them. Here. But then with BSD, and, and I know that it's really permissive, but I. Yeah. Okay. You have to bring it along, but like GPL or whatever, you have to theoretically bring it along all the time. 
Okay, yeah, maybe we can talk about that a bit later. But I don't mm -hmm. want to like drag out the talk for that. Any other questions? Okay, then thank you for your presentation. Yep, that was Welcome. good. Uh, for any further question, uh, email me. It's pretty easy. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much.